Hello everyone. Today we are going to cover bivariate regression models. The goal of a regression model is to establish causality between a dependent variable and independent variables. It is assumed that the direction of influence is clear, in the sense that we know x influences y and not vice versa. Now, let me illustrate this in a graph first. Now, suppose that you're interested in home prices and you believe that home values are going to be influenced by the square footage of the home. In this particular case, you have the dependent variable price on the vertical axis and you have the independent variable square footage on the horizontal axis. Okay. Now, suppose that I show you three lines to represent the relationship between square feet and price. And suppose that those three lines look as follows. Now, if you look at those three lines, and I ask you, well, which line fits best the relationship between those observations that represent a house for with a particular square footage and the price, then you would most likely tell me that the blue line represents this relationship best, because the red line is too far above and the green line is too far below. Now, what you know intuitively is correct, in the sense that it is the blue line. In this lecture, we are going to show how you can formalize in mathematical language that the blue line is indeed the correct one. Basically, what you know intuitively will be now translated into mathematics. In this lecture, we are going to focus on a bivariate regression model which means that we have one dependent variable and one independent variable. We are going to call the dependent variable y and the independent variable is going to be called x. Now in the case of the bivariate regression model, our goal is to find the best linear relationship between the two variables. And we assume that each observation of y is a function of x plus some random term. If you go back to the example about the uh, housing prices, what we assume is that we have the price of the home is a function of the square footage, and we assume that we have an intercept, which we call beta 0, plus a slope coefficient, which we call beta 1, times the square feet. Okay. Note that in this case, the intercept is beta 0, so this is the intercept, and beta 1 is the slope coefficient. Note that this function is very similar to the linear function which you are all familiar with, which is y is equal to mx plus b, where b is the intercept and m is the slope. So in this particular case, to draw the slope, we have, if we are going one unit on the square footage, then beta 1 is going to represent the slope. Note that we will see that in this particular case, beta 1 represents the dollar per square feet of the home values, of the average home value. Okay. Now, the question is, how do we determine this line? 
Now here I have copied the previous graph again and what we said is that there is a line, a regression line, that fits through all those observations. Okay? And note that each observation represents a different home. Okay? And we have, for example, if you take this observation here, then there is a certain square footage associated with this home, say this is a 1,200 square foot home. And we also have a price associated with this house. And assume it is $150,000. Now, for the moment, suppose that you can represent this linear function here with the following parameters. Um, price is equal to 40,000 plus 100 times square feet. So in this case we have beta 0 is equal to 40,000 and beta 1 equals 100. So in this case, for each additional square foot of your house, the home value would increase by 100. Now, in this case, you can see if beta 0 is 40,000 and beta 1 is 100, then if we have this 1,200 square foot home, we can calculate 40,000 plus 100 times 1,200 equals 160,000. So in this case, our model overestimates the price of this home and estimates this price to be $160,000. Okay? Now assume a different home. Let us assume, for example, this home here. And assume that this home has 1,500 square feet. Then in this case, our model would be 40,000 plus 100 times 1,500 and it would estimate this home to be at $190,000. But in reality, this price, this home is valued more than $190,000. Let us assume for that it is actually valued at $210,000. So you can see that given those parameters, okay, that for some homes, the value is underestimated, and for some homes, the value is overestimated. Okay? Because note that, and we will see this soon, that for no matter how many observations we have, we always only have one beta zero and one beta one. Okay? Now, it is very important to realize that the linear function does not tell us exactly what the home value will be for a given value of x, but it will actually tell us the expected value. So if you think back about the previous lectures in this class, we are calculating the expected value of the price given we have given the square footage. And now note, at the moment our model is very simple in the sense that we only have two variables. That's the name, that's the reason why we call it a bivariate model, in the sense that we have just the price and the square footage. Of course, in reality, the home value is influenced by many more variables. For example, the bedrooms, the bathrooms, if it has hardwood floors, if it has an attached garage, the lot size, location, and so on. 
right? But this will be covered at a later time period. Now, the following we will see of how we actually determine beta 0 and beta 1 such that this line fits best. So let me simply recreate the graph that we had before. And we have the home values on the uh, vertical axis. And we have the square footage on the horizontal axis. Now assume that we have some regression line. And for now, assume that we only have one observation. And let us put this observation right here. Okay. So what I'm about to demonstrate is how we're going to calculate beta 0 and beta 1, or the optimal beta 0 and beta 1. And for the moment, I am just going to focus on one single observation. Of course, there are many more observations, but the technique that I'm applying to this observation can be applied to any other observation as well. Now, suppose that you have this observation, and this observation represents a particular house. Now, this particular house is characterized by square footage, and it is also characterized by a particular price. Now, let us assume that this cross here marks the, uh, marks the, marks the home, but that we have xi, which is the square footage associated with house i, and that you have yi, which is the price of the home associated with house i. Now, we also have this regression equation, and we assume that this regression equation or this linear function can be expressed as y equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times xi. Now note that there's still a term missing here, okay, and I'll come to that. Now, for this particular case, we have our regression equation. And in this case, our regression equation underestimates the home value. Let's call the estimated home value based on our model. Let's call it yi, and we put a little hat on here. Okay. Now, our model, we can have xi, say, being equal to 1,500, suppose that the real observation is valued at $210,000, and that our model actually estimates this to be $190,000. Okay, so we have, if you remember back from the previous section where we said beta 0 is 40,000, beta 1 is 100,000. Then in this particular case, we have the 40,000 plus 100 times 1,500. And we know that this gives us 190,000. So we are right here. And so now this is the important part. In order to actually achieve the $210,000, we have to add a correction term. Now, this is not really called a correction term, but it is called an error term. So in this case, the error term is 20,000. So now here, we are adding this error term, and we call it epsilon i. So epsilon is the Greek letter. Now, this epsilon represents the vertical distance between the observation and our line. So this section here represents 
epsilon i. Now note that I have only considered this observation for now and we have calculated the error term associated with this observation. Now, in the previous slide, note that we have many different observations and for each observation we can calculate the distance between the line and the actual observation. Okay? So for each observation we have we could calculate an error term. And now note that for some observations those error terms are going to be positive, like in this case where we determined that the error term is uh, $20,000. $20, okay. So this is a positive error term, but there can also be a negative error term, like in this case here, where we determined that the error term is minus $10,000. Okay. Note that right now I have not said anything about how beta 0 and beta 1 are determined. Those two numbers, 40,000 and 100, 100, those are simply made up numbers to illustrate the concept of the linear function and the concept of the error term. Okay. Now we said that we have an error term associated with each observation. Okay? Then consider, consider this equation here. Okay. And let us rewrite this observation. Okay. Now assume that we have again y i equals beta zero plus beta one times xi plus the error term and let us solve this for the error term. Okay. And so let us have say yi minus beta 0 minus beta 1 times xi is equal to epsilon i. Okay. Now let me write this differently and put epsilon i here, an equal sign, and please leave some space here. Okay? And just write yi minus beta 0 minus beta 1 times xi. Okay? So what this equation here determines is that if I give you any beta 0, any beta 1, and I give you the observation associated with a particular house, you can calcul calculate the error term. So in the previous example, if I told you that beta 0 is 40,000, beta 1 is 100, the house is valued at $210,000 and the square footage is $1,500, what you could plug in is, you could say, uh, 210 minus 40,000 minus 100 times 1,500, that would give you the error term, the 20,000. Okay. Note that for any beta 0 and any beta 1, and also for any uh, homes, you can calculate the error term for each observation. What the regression model is going to do, first of all, since some of those error terms can be positive and some error terms can be negative, we are going to square all the error terms. So if we square the left side, we also have to square the right side. So now we have the error term of a particular observation squared. And then what we are going to do is we are going to sum them all up from i from equal to 1 to n, where n are the number of observations. And when we sum up the left-hand side, we also have to sum up the right-hand side. Okay. 
Now this equation is going to play a fundamental role in determining the optimal beta 0 and beta 1. Now to illustrate this, let me go back to the slides. And at the bottom of the slide, we have the equation that I presented, that I just presented, where we have the error term of an individual observation, we square that error term, and then we are summing up the error terms for all the observations. As you can imagine, you want to minimize the error terms. More particular, in this case, you want to minimize the sum of the squared error terms by choosing beta 0 and beta 1 such that this term here on the left-hand side is minimized. Now, very often this model is also called ordinary least square model, or OLS. Now, in order to pick beta 0 and beta 1 such that the sum of the squared residuals or the squared error terms is minimized, some knowledge of calculus is necessary. However, I'm going to skip this and I'm just going to present you the solution. To find the optimal intercept and slope coefficient, the beta 0 and the beta 1, you have to proceed in four steps. In the first step, you have to calculate the mean of your independent variables. If you think back about the home values, that would be the mean of the square footage of all homes in your data set. In the second step, you calculate the mean of the dependent variables. In our case, that would be the average price of all the homes in your data set. Now, the third step, you're going to calculate the slope coefficient, the beta 1. Okay. Note that in order to calculate the slope coefficient beta 1, what you have to do is you have to calculate, you have to take each, uh, each xi or each square footage, or you have to take a particular home, take the square footage, subtract the average square footage, multiply this by the home value minus the average home value, and you have to sum up all of this. And then you have to divide by the individual square footage minus the average square footage squared. Now this may look very complicated and we are actually going to, uh, to look at this, how this is calculated manually, but any regression software is going to do this automatically. Once you have the slope coefficient, you can use this to calculate the intercept. And the intercept is simply the average of the dependent variable minus beta 1, the slope coefficient that you had just calculated, times the average of your dependent, independent variable. Okay. Now, this last equation is actually very important in the sense that what it says is that your regression line is going to go through the average home value and the average square footage home. In the sense that suppose you have this point, suppose you have this point here. Then this point is going to be the average x or the average square footage. And it is the average y. Okay. So the regression line is going through the average values. So what I have drawn on the, on, the, on the whiteboard, I have also generated a computer graphic here where you can see the square footage as the independent variable on the horizontal axis and the price of the home on the vertical axis. Note that each of the dots represents a particular observation, a home value with the associated square footage, and the red dashed line represents the error term associated with the observation. Now note that, and I will come, I will explain this graph uh, more in detail later, that we have a histogram of the residuals or the histogram of the error terms. Okay, you can see that on average the error term is about zero, and we have some 
houses where the error term is very negative, and we have some homes where the error term is positive. Now, let us see how we would actually calculate the intercept and the slope coefficient given data. For this, I have copied what you have in your slides uh, onto this board here. So, first of all, consider that if you have data, in this case we have miles as the independent variable and we have the price as the dependent variable, that we have to calculate the slope and the intercept using four steps. In the first step, we are going to calculate the average of the dependent variable. In the second step, we are going to calculate the average of the independent variable. So in this case, the average of the dependent variable would be the average price. Now in this case, and you can verify this, the average price is uh, 21.143. 21.143. It is the average of all those values. The average miles are, in this case, are 35. Okay. Note that those values are actually in thousands. Okay, so 35,000 miles is the average, and the average price is uh, $21,143. Okay. So those are the first steps. Now, the third step, which is the most uh, burdensome, is calculating the slope using this equation. Okay. And note that you have this equation in your slides. Okay. So note that we have the average x, we have the average y. And so what we need to do is we have to take each observation. Note that each observation is indicated by i. You have to take the average miles and subtract. Uh, you have to take the miles of a particular car and subtract the average miles. This part here, let me call this part uh, a is what is done in this column here. So we take the, the miles, which is 20, and we subtract the average miles, 35. So 20 minus 35 is equal to 15. Okay. And we do this for each observation. This is what we are doing right here. Now, the second part of this equation, let's call this B, is doing the same for the miles. We take the miles of a particular car, yi, and we subtract the average miles. So in this case, we have 27 minus 21.143 gives us 4.9 something. Okay. Note that here I have done some rounding. Okay. So this column here is step B. Now step the last the, the third step here is to multiply A times B. So in this case, if we multiply negative 15 times 5.9, we get negative 87.9. Now, in the last step, we have to take xi, or the miles of an individual observation, subtract the average miles, and square the value. So in this case, we take negative 15, and we square, we square it, and we get 225. So this is negative 15 squared. Second term is negative 10 squared, and so on. Now note that the numerator has to be summed up. So a times b, and we are taking the sum. So the sum of a times b is 
is the sum of the values in this column. And this sum is equal to negative 210. So here we have the numerator. The denominator, we are going to sum up this column here. And the sum of all those values is equal to 700. Now note that now we can calculate the slope coefficient. So beta 1 is equal to negative 210 divided by 700. And hence the slope coefficient is negative 0 0.03. Sorry, negative point three. Okay. So this is how you calculate the slope coefficient. Step four is calculating the intercept. And we said that the intercept which is beta 0, is equal to y bar minus the estimated coefficient times x bar. So in this case, y bar is equal to 21.143 plus 0.3. Note we have a minus sign here, and we have a minus sign here, and hence it's plus times 35. And hence the intercept term is going to be 31.643. Okay. So if you're thinking about the data, then the linear function that describes this data best is has 31.643 as the intercept and negative 3 as the slope. Now, of course, those calculations are very burdensome, and you will see that this is much easier once we are going to use R for it. But for, before we do so, let me illustrate this example in Excel. So note that here in Excel, I have the miles, and I have the price. This is identical to what you have seen on the slides before. Now what you can do in Excel is you can plot a scatter plot. So here we have charts, let us do a scatter plot. Okay. Note that the relationship here between the miles and the price is negative, which makes sense that the longer or the further you drive your car, the lower the value. Now what you can do in Excel is you can click on a particular observation, you can right click on a particular observation, and there's a function that is called add trend line. So if you click on the add trend line, then it gives you, it adds a line between those observations. This is what we have seen at the beginning of the lecture. And then on the right hand side, you also have the option that says display equation on chart. So if you click this, what you can see is that the values that we have just calculated manually, in a sense the 31.643 as the intercept and the negative 0.3 as the slope, is exactly identical to what we have calculated uh, manually in this example here, 31.643 and negative 0.3. So now you understand how Excel calculates this trend line and how you could actually calculate this manually as well. Now, of course, you can also calculate this in Excel, uh, in R. So note that I have R here and I have already entered the miles and the price of the car. Right? Now, in R, you have to write the following. So usually I call the estimates b hat, beta hat. And what you want to do is you want to run a linear model. 
So to do this in R, you have to use the function lm, lm for linear model, and you have to enter the dependent variable, which is price in this case, then the tilde, and then the independent variable. So b hat equals lm, parenthesis open, price tilde miles. You execute this. And then note it creates an object which is called b hat. Note that we are going to look in much more detail at this object b hat. But for now, calculate or type summary b hat. And then what you get are is this output here. And for now, what we are only going to look at is the 31.643, which is the intercept and the coefficient associated with the miles, which represents the slope coefficient, the negative 0.3. Okay. So what we have seen so far is that we started with three lines, and we said that we want the regression line that fits the observations the best. And we said that this line can be represented by an intercept and by a slope. We have then determined the error terms associated with the various observations. And we said that the beta 0 and the beta 1, which determines the form of the, of the function, which fits the observation the best, is obtained by minimizing the, the sum of the squared error terms. This is what we have done with this equation here. Okay. And finally, we have then applied the result of that equation to calculate the intercept and the slope manually. But of course, you can also calculate those intercept and slope coefficients by using Excel and also by using R or any other statistical software. Note that Excel is very good at calculating the slope and the intercept for a bivariate model, but what we are going to do in the future is well beyond that. At the end of this lecture, you're also going to understand how to interpret all the other information that R and R Studio puts out. But this will be part of the next lecture. Hello everyone. In the last lecture, we have seen how to calculate the intercept beta 0 and the slope beta 1 for a bivariate regression model. In this lecture, we provide meaning to those coefficients. Because remember, if you have data and the equations, you can plug in the data into the equations and you're going to get results for beta 0 and beta 1. But the goal of any regression model is to provide causality of how the independent variables influence the dependent variables. The coefficients alone are not going to tell you anything about the direction or the strength of this relationship. This is what will be covered in this lecture. Now, before we continue, I would like to cover certain assumptions that are necessary for the bivariate regression model and also the multivariate regression model, which we are going to see in the next lecture, to work. Those assumptions are very important in order to get unbiased estimates of our coefficients. The first assumption is that the linear regression model is valid. Note that we are not looking at a linear relationship between the variables, but that we are looking at a linear model. And I will get to this in the future. We also assume that the disturbance terms or the error terms epsilon have an average value of zero or the mean value is zero. We also assume homoscedasticity and I will provide an example of what that is in the next lecture. We also have that there is no correlation between the disturbance terms and we must assume that the number of observations is greater than the number of parameters. The last assumption is that there is no multicollinearity, or at least no perfect multicollinearity in our model. And I will explain what that is later on. 
Note that when we are talking about a linear regression model, we assume a regression model which is linear in parameters. So for example, in the past lecture we have had an a dependent variable y, which is a function of beta 0 plus beta 1, and times xi, which is the independent variable. Note that the following models are also linear in parameters. So for example, take the second equation here, which is yi equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times xi plus beta 2 times xi squared. Then note that we have beta 1 times x and beta 2 times x squared, that this is also a linear equation. However, if you're going to graph this, you will see that the function is not linear, but it's actually a curve. And again, I will provide an example of this later. We have talked a lot about natural logarithms in the context of this class, and we will see that the natural logarithm also provides a very important insights into models. Now, here is a recreation of the graph that you have seen in the previous lecture, where we were looking at home prices and square footage. On the left side, you see the observations, you see the regression line, and you also see the red dashed lines, which represent the error terms. On the right side, you see a histogram of the residuals. This is basically the size of the red dashed bars on the left side represented in a histogram. As you can see, on average, the values are zero. They are also normally distributed. Homoscedasticity is a very important assumption for the coefficient estimates and also the standard errors to be unbiased. Now, the best way to explain homoscedasticity is to compare it with a heteroscedastic model. This is what I have done on the next slide. On the left-hand side, you see homoscedastic data. You have the square footage and you have the price, and you can see that the variance of the error terms along the line remains constant. Now think about that you have a constant, um, constant variance across the lines. Compare this to the right-hand side graph, where for small square footages you have a little bit of variance in the error terms, and for large square footages you have a lot of variance in the error terms. Think about this as the size of the home gets larger, there may be much more variance in terms of price of the home. I have recreated this graph here, and so for homoscedastic data, think about that you have a constant bandwidth along the regression line, like this, and that for heteroscedastic data, you have this increasing variance. Note it can also be decreasing variance, think about simply as non-constant variance around the regression line. We will see that the slope coefficients are still unbiased, but that the standard errors are going to be biased. And we will see that the standard errors need to be unbiased to make meaning out of our models. <clears throat> now, other assumptions, other important assumptions are that there is no correlation or no autocorrelation between the error terms and that there's also no covariance or correlation between the error terms and the individual independent variables. We also need to have what is called full rank of the model. Note that this assumption is usually not, um, is usually given, uh, given your data. It only also, it says that you need to have more observations than variables to estimate. Think about that you cannot solve for three unknowns with only two equations. And the last assumption is that we do not have perfect multicollinearity. For this class, you can assume that the assumptions are satisfied for the data you are working with. 
Okay, so now we are going to look at measuring the strength of the relationship. To measure the strength of the hypothesized relationship between the dependent and the independent variables of the regression equation, we are going to calculate a value which is called r squared. The value r of r squared can be thought of as an indicate, indicator of goodness of fit, or how well the sample regression line fits your sample data. To see how this statistic is used, we decompose the variation of y in the sample into two components, the unexplained variation and the explained variation. Let me explain the concept of explained and unexplained variation graphically. Consider the graph on home values where the independent variable is home values and the independent variable is square footage. We have a regression line that is characterized by price equals beta 0 plus beta 1 times the square footage. And we said before that any regression line goes through the average value of x and y. So in this case, the regression line goes through the average square footage and the average price. So note that we have one observation up here and let's call this observation xi and yi. Note that I have called the average price and the average square footage p bar and, uh, and sqf t bar but let's make it this consistent with the lecture notes that you have in your on that you can find on canvas and let's just call it y bar and x bar now <clears throat> consider you are starting here at this average point and what you want your regression model to do is if you are moving away from this point, so if you are having a variation in x, so if you have a variation in the square footage, then you want your model to translate this into a variation of price. Because you want to know of if the square footage varies, how does the price vary? So think about you are moving in, away from the average point. So you're moving from x bar to xi. Then you want your model to actually translate this movement in x into a movement in y. So in this particular case, this movement in x is indeed translated into a movement of y in the sense that y is increasing, or the price of the home is increasing if you are increasing the square footage. Now in this particular case, we have the observation xi, and this translates into a price of yi for, the, for this particular home, which is the, the real observation in your model, in your data. Now, as you can see, your model only explains part of this variation in y. So you have this part here, is going to be the explained variation, up to this point here. But then there is this entire part here which is unexplained. And this is going to be called the unexplained variation. Now the total movement which we observed in the data from y bar to yi. This total distance is called the total variation.
if your model was perfect, the movement from x bar to xi, your model, if your model was perfect, it could explain the total variation. However, any model will not be perfect, and hence there will always be an unexplained variation. Now, think about the to total variation to be 100%. And say, in this case, your explained variation is only 60%. And the unexplained variation is the remaining 40%, or re represents the remaining 40%. Okay. Now, here we only look at one particular observation. But this is true for any observation that we have in our model, given our regression line. To put very simply, the R squared, in this case, can be thought as the ratio of the explained variation over the total variation. So in this case, the R squared would be 0.6. Okay. Now we will see that the R squared has to be equal, is always limited between 0 and 1. Okay? The R squared can be 0, it can be 1, or anything in between. It cannot be negative and it cannot be larger than 1. Okay? So think of the R squared as a percentage that explains, that explains your model, okay? or as a percentage of how much your model explains the total variation. Okay. So if you go back to the slides, okay, we have the, the residual variation or the residual or the unexplained variation, which is yi minus yi hat. So in this case here, note that we have y i hat right here going exactly to this to, to this point here okay so the unexplained variation is y i minus y i hat the explained variation is y i hat minus y bar. So this is the um, unexplained variation. This is the explained variation. And then the last one, I have to write it down here, is y i minus y bar, which is the total variation. Okay. This is represented in the three terms which you see on this slide here. Now, we said before that you can think about the r squared as the explained sum of squares over the total sum of squares. And remember, in the graph that I showed you before, we are just looking at one variable, but in, or one observation, but in reality we have many observations. And this is represented here, okay, where we are summing over all the observations, and we are squaring and summing all the distances. So the R squared is the explained sum of squares over the total sum of squares. Note that in many regression models, and if you are using statistical software, you have also what is called the adjusted R squared. Okay. Now this will become important when we are looking at multiple independent variable, independent variables, in when we are talking about multivariate regression. It can be shown that the R squared is increasing if we have a very large number of observations or if you have a very large number of explanatory variables. 
in order for this increase, which is due to, due to mathematical theory, in order to correct for this increase, statistical software also reports the adjusted R squared. So think about this as a correction factor. The next aspect or the next topic is going to be very important for the remainder of the semester. And this is what is called hypothesis testing of the coefficients. Now, we have talked about hypothesis testing before, and we will see why this is important in the regression model. The good news is that any statistical software is going to make a hypothesis test for you while providing the output data. Now, to explain this, what we, why we need this hypothesis test, uh, let me run a simulation for you. Think back about the first part of this lecture, of the first part about this statistics class, and I have told you that we have a population, and that population is characterized by unknown parameters. And we are going to use statistics to estimate or recover those unknown parameters. We said that in order to do so, we take a sample from the population and we are estimating the parameters, knowing that if we are taking a second sample and a third sample from the population, that our estimated parameters are going to vary. Now, what is true when we are talking about hypothesis testing and statistics in the first part of the class is also true when we are going to talk about regression analysis in this part of the class. Now, consider the following. I have run a simulation here, and what I have done <coughs> is I have created a population of homes. And that population is characterized by an intercept of 50,000 and by a slope coefficient of 100. So I have randomly created 1 million homes, and so you have in the column housing, or you have in the data set housing here, you have the price of 1 million homes, and you have the associated square footage. And let us assume for now that that is the population, that represents the population. Now, if we had data about the entire population, which we never have, we could run a linear regression model with price as the dependent variable and square footage as the independent variable, and we could estimate our coefficients. So in this case, let me call this beta head population, and I'm using again the command lm for linear model, and we have seen this in the first part of the bivariate regression lecture. I estimate the b head population, and I summarize the data. I summarize the, the regression output, and you can see that indeed we have an intercept of 50,000, or close to 50,000, and we have a slope coefficient of about 100, or in this case, this case 99.8. Okay. Now, let me run a simulation here. So what I mean by simulation is I'm going to draw a sample of 50 homes from this population. I'm drawing the sample of 50 homes and I'm going to estimate the coefficients. I'm going to estimate the intercept and I'm going to estimate the slope. Now, theoretically, what I want is that my model is going to recover the intercept of 50,000 and the slope coefficient of 100 given the sample of 50 homes. Now note that in order to run a sample, I can use a command here which is called sample. If you are interested of how this exactly works, then please send me an email. But for now, just assume that you can run a sample, you can run this line here, and what you do is you get a housing sample. Now in this housing sample here, you have 50 homes that is drawn from the population. And you can see here that, for example, home out of the 1 million homes, home 816, 109 is selected. 
or 457, 619 is selected, and so on. So here you only have 50 homes. Now I can then run an estimate, and let me just write summary b hat. And this is only based on those 50 homes. So here you can see that the intercept is estimated to be 64,000, 64, and the slope coefficient is nine, estimated at 91, which is very close to the 100. Okay. Now the question is what happens if I draw different samples from the population? How are the coefficients actually going to vary? And this is exactly what I'm about to do here. What I will be doing, the simulations here, refers to the number of samples I'm going to draw from the population. And I'm always going to draw 50 homes a thousand times. And every time I draw a sample of 50 homes, I'm going to, I'm going to estimate the coefficients. And in this step here, in the last step, I'm actually going to record those coefficients. Okay? So let us execute this right now. This may take a couple of seconds, and we are done. So now what we have done in this column, I have drawn a thousand times 50 homes out of this population, and at every time for every uh, sample, I have recorded the intercept, which is in the first column here, and I have recorded the slope in the second column here. Now, we will see that the interpretation of the intercept is usually not important. Okay? An intercept can also be negative, and we usually do not care too much about the intercept. But what we really care in this regression analysis is how the independent variable, square footage in this case, influences the price. Now what you can see is that we have certain samples where we are going to est where the estimate about the square footage is very low or the slope coefficient is very low. So note that in reality for each square foot that the home increases the value of the home should increase by $100. Now out of those 1000 samples we see that the lowest estimate is at $42. And we can also see that the highest estimate provides us with $188. Okay? But note that if you are calculating the mean of the estimates, and now we are just looking at the second column of the slope coefficients, that the mean is actually very close to 100. Okay? So in this case, it is actually 101. Also, if we are going to draw a histogram of those coefficients, then we will see. Then we will see that the majority of estimates is around 100, and that we only have a couple of estimates that are very low, and a couple of estimates that are very high. Now we saw that we have variation around the slope coefficient. We have we have slope coefficients that have a low that are estimated at a very low value or at a very high value. And now this is very important. Note that despite the fact that we have variation, the slope coefficient is never estimated at zero. Now, why is this important? Consider the model where we have price is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 times the square footage. If for some reason beta 1 was equal to 0, what this means is that no matter how you vary the square footage, if you multiply it by something that is zero, 
it does not have an effect on the price. Okay? So if beta 1 was 0, then square footage would not influence price. Now, what any statistical software is doing is setting up a hypothesis test and also executing that hypothesis test. And that hypothesis test is as follows. We have H0, the null hypothesis, and H0 is that the intercept and the slope coefficients are equal to 0, and the alternative hypothesis is that those slope coefficients or intercept are not equal to 0. Okay. Now, Note that since we only have, you, we usually have only one sample, we can estimate the standard error for the slope coefficient, and we can also estimate the standard error for the intercept. Note that estimating the standard error also depends on the sample size. Okay? The larger the sample size, the smaller your standard error is going to be. This is very similar to the hypothesis test that we have seen in previous lectures. Okay, Now don't worry too much about those equations because any statistical software is going to execute those hypothesis tests for you. Okay, Now think about the hypothesis test in the case of uh, a sample which we have seen in the past. Okay. So if we are doing what is called a t-test, then the test statistic is equal to the mean x bar minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard error. Okay. Now, in the case of a hypothesis test in a regression model, the hypothesized value, the hypothesized mean, is equal to zero. So the test statistic in a regression model is simply the coefficient divided by the standard error of the coefficient. And this follows a t-distribution. With n minus 2 degrees of freedom in the case of a bivariate regression model. Because in a bivariate model, we are estimating two coefficients, the intercept and the slope. Now, this is what you have illustrated on this slide. Okay. Now, let us actually do a numerical analysis here using data that I have collected about Honda Accords in the Indianapolis area. So, the data is available on Canvas, and it is called a Honda.csv. We have 81 entries, and we have the miles of the Honda Accord, and we have the price of the used car as well. To run a regression equation, we have to type in b hat equals lm for linear model, then we first have the dependent variable price, tilde the independent variable miles, and the data set is equal to Honda. Then we say summary, we hat, and we get our regression output. So note that you now have the following. Under call, R tells you what you have just estimated. You have estimated price as a function of miles using the data set Honda. 
it also tells you something about the residuals. Remember the residuals, here are the error terms. Okay. So that the median error term is negative 139, which means that 50% have a lower error term or negative uh, below 139, negative 139, and 50% are above negative 139. Then we have the coefficient estimates here, means that the intercept is 22,000 and the miles is negative, six, negative uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.065. Okay? So what this means is that for each additional mile you drive with your car, it decreases the value by 6.5 cents. Now, the important aspect here are the standard error, the t-value, which represents your test statistic, and the p-value here. Okay? Now, note that in any regression model, you only have to look at the column that indicates the probability or indicates the p-value. And there is no change between interpreting the p-value in this regression model and interpreting the p-value in any other hypothesis test. And that is, if the p-value is below the level of significance, then you are rejecting the null hypothesis. Now, let us consider the hypothesis test executed for miles. Note that the coefficient estimate for miles is negative 0 0.065, which is our beta 1. And the standard error associated with beta 1 is estimated to be negative 0 0.0125. Now, the hypothesis test is that beta 1 is equal to 0 and the alternative hypothesis is that beta 1 is different from 0. Note that here we are talking about the estimated value whereas here we are talking about the population value. So to calculate the test statistic we have to take negative point 0 0 six five divided by negative uh, sorry divided by zero point zero one two five and what we get is negative five point one nine eight, which is the value that you are seeing here. The negative five point one nine eight, which is the estimate divided by the standard error gives you the t value. Okay. Now the probability column here gives you the probability or the p-value associated with observing this t-value based on your null hypothesis. So if you remember from the hypothesis testing, we have we have the t-distribution And we have the hypothe hypothesized value of zero. Okay, so here we hypothesize that beta one is equal to zero. Now we calculate a t statistic, a test statistic of negative five point one nine eight. Now this value is 
to the left and suppose that it is here. Now, this probability tells us what is the probability of observing the estimate of negative 0.065 under the hypothesis, or given the null hypothesis. And you can see that this value is extremely small. Okay, So that basically represents the probability right here. Since we are testing, usually we are testing at 5% or 10%, okay? that means that in this case we are rejecting the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is that that coefficient is zero. Which means that there is evidence in our model that miles does have an influence on price of the vehicle. And of course this makes this makes sense. Now to make life easier to interpret those values, any statistical software provides you with little stars besides the coefficient estimates. Now those stars are very important. Before in the regular lecture about hypothesis testing, we said that we assume usually a significance level of 5%, but in the homework I also said that assume a significance level of say 1% or 10%. Now the regression output is usually a little bit more flexible. What we care about are three significance levels. 10%, 5%, and 1%. Now, what you usually see in regression outputs from Stata and also in uh, scientific journals is that if a variable is statistically at the 10% level, it is marked with one star. If it's significant at the 5% level, it is marked with two stars. And if it's significant at the 1% level, it is marked with three stars. Okay, so that means if the p-value in this last column is, or if the p-value is below 10%, one star, below 5%, two stars, below 1%, it is three stars. Now, if it's below 10%, okay, then we are talking about statistical significance. Meaning that, the, that there is strong evidence that the coefficient estimate is not zero. Now, you can change that but R has a slightly different notation in the sense that at 10% it simply marks those with a point. At 5% it marks it with one star. At 1% at 5% it marks it with one star. At 1% it marks it with two stars. And at 0.1%, it marks it with three stars. Okay. Note that you can also see this interpretation here. So there is no marking if the p-value is between 10% uh, and 100%. If it's below between 5% and 10%, it is marked with the star, uh, with the dot. If it's below 1% and 5%, it is one star below 0.1% and 1% two stars, and below 0.1% it is marked with three stars. Note that in this case the values are well below 0.1%, so they are marked with three stars. It turns out that if you are opening a scientific article and you are interested in the results, 
all you have to do is go to the table that reports the regression analysis and check out how many stars there are with the variables. Once you know what the stars are, and also once you know what the dependent variable is, it basically tells you all you need to know about the results of the paper. Okay, so coming back to the model right here, note that we have created an object which is called b hat. Okay? It contains a lot of information about the statistical analysis of price and miles for the data set. Okay? So, for example, suppose that you would like to plot the residuals, or you want to plot the scatter plot of price and miles, as well as the regression line. What you can do is you can type in plot Honda price, a uh, Honda miles, comma, Honda price. And you get this regression. And you get this, uh, this plot. Okay. You can then type in app line or AB line, B hat, where B hat is the output from your regression equation. And what it does is it adds the regression line to your data. You also can, if you're interested in how the residuals or the error terms look like for the, for the plot or for the, um, for this data set, you can say hist b hat dollar, dollar sign residuals and you now have a plot of the residuals of your data set. If you're interested in the predicted values, I suggest that you do the following. You say Honda dollar sign, uh, let's just call it predicted, equals b hat dollar sign fitted values. Now what you have is in your data set, when you open this, you now have miles and price, which is the original data, but it also has the value which would be predicted based on your model. Now in this case, we have the car with 30, 37,329 miles. Your model would predict that that car is valued at $19,625. Think about, for example, a web page like the Kelly Blue Book, where you can enter the make, the model, and the characteristics of your car, and it gives you a predicted value of the car. This would be in, of interest to you if you wanted to sell your car. Now, this is extremely similar. Here, we are only looking at miles as the characteristic of your car. But of course, it also depends on what type of engine you have, how old the car is, etc. Also note that in the model, we have an adjusted R squared value of 0.2454. What this means is that miles alone explain about 24% of the variation in, your, in the price of the used car. Now, in the following lectures, we are going to expand on those examples in the sense that we are going to have many more independent variables, and we will then also see how to, we will also practice the interpretation of those coefficients. Okay. Now, the last topic that I would like to talk about are functional forms. Okay. So, before we said that one of the assumptions is that the model is linear in parameters. Okay. Now, that does not mean that we are, we are only going to be interested in modeling linear relationship between the data. With a linear model, we can also model nonlinear relationships. So log of y is equal to 1 plus beta 2 times the log of x, 
can model various relationships depending on the value of beta 2. So for example, we have if beta 2 is equal to 1, then we have this linear relationship here. But if beta 2 is below 1, so say for example 0.5, then we have a nonlinear relationship. And if it's above 1, we have an exponentially increasing relationship. We can also have polynomial functions, and we'll come to this in the future of why we need why we would use those functions. And so this is just to highlight that a linear model can also estimate nonlinear relationships. Now there is one additional aspect that I need to mention, and this is with regard to the intercept. Now, I said before that interpreting the intercept can be tricky and is usually not necessary. Now, in this case here, the intercept is estimated to be around $22,000. Now, what this means is that if miles is equal to zero, then the intercept is $22,000. What this means is, theoretically, is that a car with zero miles, which is a use, which is a brand new car, is valued at twenty-two thousand dollars. Now, if you think about how cars depreciate, then what you would see is that new cars, right when it drives off the lot, depreciates very rapidly. Okay, so you would have if you had data about new cars, then you would see our cars with very low mileage. You would see that it would look approximately like this, where you have a regression line, or where you, if you wanted to fit a regression line here, it would look something like this. Okay, so you have this very steep decrease at the beginning. Now what we actually estimate in our model, or with the regression line, first of all, note that we do not have new cars in our data set. Suppose we only have cars that are in this miles range in here. So we have miles and we have price. Okay. So in this section, a linear relationship may be appropriate, whereas in this section, the same linear relationship is not appropriate. Okay, So if we make predictions about used cars, we should only make predictions about miles that are actually in our data set. So suppose we have cars in our data set that have between 10,000 miles and 50,000 miles, then we should only make predictions about, say, a new car that is between 10,000 and 50,000 miles. And we should not use our model to make a prediction about a car that has, say, 500 miles. Because 500 miles is outside our data set, and our model is only calibrated for 10,000 miles and 50,000 miles, or between 10,000 miles and 50,000 miles. Okay, So here, the meaning or the interpretation of the intercept for this model is meaningless. Okay? So this concludes the lecture about bivariate regression, and we are going to move on to multivariate regression, and we are going to see a lot of the concepts that we have learned in this lecture also in the next lecture.